Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ancient Warfare Podcast. Uh, with me today are Lindsay Powell, Mark Vicentis, Mark McCaffrey, Murray Dam, and um, I am Jasper Ortuis. I am the editor of Ancient Warfare magazine, and today we'll be discussing the latest issue, Ancient Warfare issue 16.3, which deals with uh, the Roman Empire in the East from the 4th, the 5th, and 6th centuries AD. Um, difficult time for the empire or empires. Um, we can maybe talk about that, whether it's one or two or not, and how one part lasted so long, despite being battered, I think we can say, from uh, both the northern and eastern sides, almost constantly uh, by Gothic peoples um, uh, in the north and the, and the Sasanian Empire in the east. That's what the issue deals with, and that's what we'll be talking about tonight. Uh, we, we, oddly enough, only have one question from... The audience um, to get us going, but I'm sure after that we'll uh, we'll think of something to talk about. Um, my question is: even though Latin was the language of the army, how present were other languages like Greek and other dialects in military functions? And I suppose that is a question that really extends chronologically before that. Certainly, um, any, anybody want to pitch in there? It's uh... well, I think the the official language remains Latin for the. Uh... The Roman army, um, and even though most of our sources for certainly for later Roman and the East are written in Greek, um, there's still generally transliterations of Rome of Latin terms um, or, or translations of Latin terms. Whereas we, you know, we know that you know even the Eastern Empire, who idiomatically spoke Greek and uh, you know other languages rather than Latin, the administrative language is still Latin. So, what was spoken in the, you know, in the ranks uh, would have had to know some Latin to know, you know, presumably orders um, are given in Latin. Uh, we don't know specifically. I think one again, one of our only sources of Latin orders is a Greek handbook. <laughs> um, so they're listed in Greek, but you're like, but were they given in Greek um, or were they given in Latin? And that's just a, a sort of an equivalency. So I think it's a bit like uh, and the analogy of the French Foreign Legion, that, um, yes, you can speak whatever language you like, but we do this in this language, and you'll learn what at least what those words mean in order to be able to perform your duties. I, I, and my, my top and say it be worth a two cents worth, depending on your which side of the Atlantic you are, uh, would be, I mean, my period is Augustus, right? So about half the army is actually made of auxiliary units. Um, a lot of them are going to be coming from geographies way outside the empire, um, so they're going to be de default, not probably Latin speakers. So they're going to have to be speaking in their language. And what's what's interesting is um, is the degree to which would there have been, for example, translators. You can imagine that the prefect of the unit would have been a Roman speaking Latin predominantly, um, and there may well have been someone speaking pidgin Latin that he would probably sort of say, "Get your men to do this." Uh, but what, and there were translators. We know that, but how, how many of those were there deployed across units? I have not a hope of an idea. But my, my guess is a bit like presumably the British Army with the Gurkha regiments, where where the commanders at a certain point learn Gurkha language, uh, um, uh, which is Nepalese. actually for, we we know for the Romans it's the other way around too. It's often tribal elites that get introduced to Rome, get some kind of Roman rank, and I suppose have to then that they, they probably they might get educated in Rome. I mean, there's uh, you mentioned before we started. You mentioned the Vindolanda tablets, and there is. Um, I think is a famous one where a a Batavian writes to his commander, who has an otherwise completely uh, Latinized name, but calls him his king, which suggests the guy is also a Batavian, but is a Batavian from the Batavian elites. But I think what you what the impression you have is it, it is a multilingual, multicultural thing, oiled and facilitated as 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 Murray had said by the common language and the grading system of ranks by Latin. That that's the only way it can work. You also got a little bit less mobility in terms of the as the army goes into the, that later part of the imperial period, and so therefore, if you're going to be establishing yourself as a, a unit more thoroughly in one location, you sort of assume that they are getting more akin with the, the local languages that, you know, they're surrounded by, um, you know, at least the, the troops and dealing with the everyday, you know, issues as such will be. You know, I think all, all the all the the bog standard go where you're told for most soldiers, which, you know, in, in 
more modern terms is this whole kind of autonomy of the individual, uh, which, you know, didn't exist. Uh, you don't really need to know language except go where the man in front of you is going and the guy with the, you know, more elaborate plume points um, and, and do what you do. So because in the East, for instance, you start to get these very long uh, serving uh, Hunnic commanders under Belisarius. He has a he has a, a Hunnic commander throughout his campaigns. And, you know, he has uh, 600 Hunnic horse archers fighting for Belisarius in the East. And then he takes them to North Africa. Um, so, you know, these are tribesmen who are encouraged to fight the way they fight they're in the service of rome absolutely but they are they are they're hunter horse archers so they're not even being made into a roman unit they're not even being fought you know formed into a fighting style which would presume that they would learn latin terminology it's like you do what you do i'll tell you where to be and go but you just do it so that kind of probably reinforces that idea that the elite the commander the, the trusted the leader of that horse archer unit He's maybe speaking some Latin, um, and again, we don't learn of Belisarius learning Hunnic, for instance, or, or, you know, is there a shared language? Is it more likely that they learned some kind of Thracian-accented Greek and that therefore there's a Greek common language rather than even Latin, even though we've said Latin's the common terminology? So all of that is is unknown because no one ever says to us that. But at the same time, there are embassies, you know, Priscus being the most famous one, from the east to the Hunnic capital. What are they speaking? You know, how are all these embassies? Because they can't not talk. There must be someone who speaks a common language, and that common language we would assume would be Latin, but it might be uh, Greek. Depending uh, on where you are, perhaps. Uh, and similarly, I suppose, we don't know how various Gothic tribes who just get introduced into the empire and then start fighting for Rome, communicated. Again, you know, this that idea of there must be someone on the outskirts who knows that language, who knows the, the, the language, the common language, whether it be Greek or, you know, traders, merchants, whatever, that know enough to get by and that that then translates into a, a, a sort of a, a passage of, of diplomacy where there's enough connections going, well, you speak that language, they speak this language, they speak that language, you talk to them, to them, to them, to them. Uh, you know, and eventually you get a, a, a sort of a string of, of, so you can therefore have, because uh, I think just recently on, this is Lindsay's expertise here, uh, under the bus, Lindsay, um, two Roman coins were found on an unoccupied island in the Baltic. And they're like, where did these come from? Um, and having, you know, some Roman coins and uh, I, I Loathe to admit it that I have lost a couple of Roman coins in Australia, <laughs> unless it was a modern, unless it was a modern tourist, you know, visiting the island with their Roman coins and dropping them. But you know what? But the thing that, that is so often found north of the uh, Rhine, in fact, are Roman daggers. So military daggers are very popular. You find them going all the way through Denmark and places. Uh, it, it's quite surprising, and you can see why. I mean, the 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 the, the scabbards are beautifully decorated with inlay, so they're, they're just beautiful objects, high status, but they're very portable as well. So they have tradable value. Uh, so it, it, those sorts of things and coins, of course, are so easy to lose. Uh, and there are even you can even buy these on the open market. Uh, in fact, um, I think they're called fol f o l l e s, which is to say they're. Um, copies, they're fraudulent copies, where they're made in other places outside the empire where they'll have, for example, like a lead or a base metal, and then they'll put a metal foil over it and then hammer it. And they look they look pretty dumb. But to an uneducated eye, you could actually literally turn the base metal into silver, typically, um, and they will travel long distances because those people don't know what a real Roman coin looks like. And I think the interesting thing there is that the, the, the diplomatic connection must have existed to some degree all that far north or wherever else you go. Well, look at that that famous uh, silver cup, which was uh, the, is it the rugby cup, I think it's called, uh, which in fact, if I've got, it's all coming back to gradually, but uh, wasn't it supposed to be one of Varus's generals or something like that? It, I, I think the name Saturninus comes to mind. But but the point is, that's a very long way and it's a very um, spectacular find. And the fact that it's so far away suggests it was a traded good, maybe a diplomatic good uh, at some point. Of course, it doesn't have to be a single trade. It can be a whole bunch of them or a whole, ser a whole series of trades over time. In the aftermath of the First Punic War, when Carthage evacuated Sicily and the 
Carthaginian troops were brought back to North Africa to be paid, uh, there was a problem between the you know, the Carthaginian uh, paymasters and the mercenary troops, which were the bulk of Carthage's armies. And when Carthaginian envoys went to meet with the the, the mercenaries, there was a problem in communicating with them because very few, uh, whatever the Carthaginians were saying, had to be translated into the various languages of the mercenary troops from wherever they came from. So the, the Carthaginians of the uh, third century BC, that is, they had long serving mercenary uh, troops who had been in Sicily. Some of them must have been there for years, maybe decades, and had not learned enough Punic to actually understand what was being said to them. So I could easily see, you know, just you know, taking this forward several centuries to uh, you know, troops in Roman service, that uh, even long serving uh, uh, common soldiers in the Roman army may not have had more than a, a smattering of Latin. That being said, I could easily see many of those troops learning enough Latin to actually be proficient in it. But there, it probably varied, and most, you know, most Roman soldiers would have needed enough to follow orders and not much more to be employable. Yeah, but you, I'm thinking of the if you think of the. Um... Uh, of inscriptions and papyri in the east, you can you can see that the inscriptions are sometimes in Greek, for instance, and even soldiers' tombstones might have Greek text, although mostly I think still or often still in in Latin. But then the administrative texts, which are written by you know not certainly not officers, but you know by you know there's a few the few bits of payment scripts that we have and you know the the various um uh you know daily order lists and stuff that's all still often in latin so there must have been a lot of people at various levels who were able to, to communicate in, in multiple languages well we've got the you know we've got the uh, egyptian papyri letters that survive which are written in greek to relatives but clearly there's a scribe who can write those letters for them and presumably translate if required. And that, that would, you know, they highly uh, educated some of these soldiers. So clearly there's a multilingual thing in some cases. I was going to say, it also depends on what Latin you're talking about. Um, because there's, I think there's evidence to say that there's a, uh, your, how can I say, your formal Latin. And there's also going to be your localized Latin of, you know, dialects but you know how we can sort of identify those is difficult because of course our written latin um that comes through in our sources is all coming through an education process whereby uh they're the, these boys in uh you know roman education facilities going to these ludi magistry they're being taught uh to how can i say echo and you know mimic the the classical latin of the you know the great scholars like you know cicero or um vegetius or you know it's, it's they're being trained to you know take on the voice of these great authors so therefore it's a, a very stoic uh style of you know we're going to keep this latin and it's and its rules as is but how that latin would then you know appear in terms of an everyday latin language between the troops and bringing in their, the influence of their own languages, which inevitably is going to blend and mix and evolve with the Latin at the same time. Um, it's That is something we'll probably never be able to work out because it's not there in any of the written sources. No, exactly. And I think, you know, coming back to that point that they never learn enough, but, you know, they've got a diploma. They might be able to identify their name. They might not be able to read their name, but someone else pointed out that's your name. <laughs> uh, you know, there's this diploma that they've kept in a language they don't speak. Uh, and even talking to some that they don't actually learn the language, but they recognize the sound of particular words to mean particular things. So they don't know Latin and they don't know, you know, they don't even know what their orders mean. They simply know that that sound means I'm what I march forward or I turn right or I turn left in my own language. So it's actually not even to the point of you speak enough Latin to know your orders. It's like, no, no, you just know that that noise means you do that thing. 
You know, it's interesting. So in the reenactment group at the Omen Street Guard, which I'm a pro veteran, um, would, would issue commands in, in Latin. And and 90% of the guys that, that would would be in kit don't speak Latin to any level. Um, a few smattering ones do. And that's exactly how it was for them. Someone would say, proque dite. And you just know, oh, that means go, move. Right. You know, Accelerate. You know, charge. Uh, and so you just do respond to what other people around you do. That's how, that's yeah. how it works. Someone, someone needs to know. Because if you know, if you get rid of all the people who actually know and they're like, that word, I think that means, ah, uh, does it doesn't mean left? And by that time, you're already in trouble. There are at least two questions that I'd like to a- a- answer or at least a- ask concerning this. That is, uh, how, what was the extent in towards the later Roman Empire of uh, mono ethnic? Uh, uh, regiments in the Roman army units. That is, how many, how likely was it that you were going to be fighting among your ethno linguistic compatriots in the late Roman army? Further, uh, uh, if you were in an area where you were in a long standing y- y- unit that had garrisoning some particular part of the empire, uh, you, you almost certainly would have learned some of the language of the civilians surrounding you. So for example, if you were you know, in a long-standing place along the Rhine, maybe you did learn Latin, or maybe if you were in the East, you did learn Greek. So uh, a lot of that was probably depending on where you served, who you were serving with, which, which and, and the, the interesting thing is, is that I think the distinction between legionaries and auxiliaries breaks down in the period under question of the late Roman Empire in which you're looking at. On the other hand, has already uh, broken down by then. Right. Really. There, are, there are still, I, I think, certainly, for example, we were talking about the Hunnic horse archers. There were still, I think, a, a number of units which would have been uh, uh, relatively uh, uniform in the ethnicity and therefore the language of their, uh, their, their, the soldiers within them. So maybe depending on how much you needed to learn was either more or less. I would I would take the English uh, the British Empire model and flip that and say well actually the civilians learn the language of the army not the other way around so therefore if your troops are speaking Batavian your locals are learning Batavian they're not learning Latin through the army they're learning the language that the troops speak because they're going to come out and shop in Batavian and therefore you're going to speak to them in their language and like oh I'll go to their shop they speak our language rather than Latin necessarily so it's that weird that way but i mean and we do get that you know in the in the natitia dignitatum you've got the batave so are they still batavians they've got the name batavians there, there's lots of units in the natitia that still maintain their original typology of, of this is this legion from this place but are they still we know that several of the positions in the late roman army become hereditary and so you know the 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 units who are not allowed to marry then they're allowed to marry then they're allowed to have children their children get recognized on the death of the soldier who then take on the you know enlist in the same unit as their parent my my guess is my guess is that they're, they're still speaking latin as opposed to the other languages simply because the inscriptions are written in latin and I, okay, I know there are one or two in Palmyrene, for example, but that, that they seem to be recut isolated cases. But overwhelmingly, it doesn't matter whether you're in. So, so for example, in the twilight of the Western Empire in Wales, where I come from originally, I mean, they have these um, Celtic crosses, and, and the things before them are, are written in this really crude script, but they're Latin. The names are Latin names. So, uh, so I think that's that's what I would point to. I mean, there, the, the, of course, in the late third century, you've got this the sort of the death of the inscription, the the funerary inscriptions sort of peter out. Uh, we only got a couple from the fourth century uh, in the in the same sort of quantity that we had previously. Uh, so that could be part of it as well. Um, I was going to come back to uh, Mark's point about the, you know, the idea that this, this uh, educated Latin, and one of the funny things you get is mistakes by Ammianus Marcellinus, for instance, and other authors who use the wrong word or the wrong term. So for instance, they talk about Legio 10 Fortensis, not Fretensis. Uh, and, you know, hang on, is it the strong legion or is it the iron legion? And the often the commentary is this is a mistake. And you're like, is it a mistake? Or was it known yeah, as both? If it's Fretensis, it's not it's not iron. It's it's for sure straight. Yeah, straight. it's a straight. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, but there's, you know, there's multiple epithets for multiple. Completely legions, lost. Yeah. Uh, origin. Completely lost. And and the idea that, 
Because I think one of, uh, in Amida, for instance, in 359, one of them is the Fortensis Legion. You're like, wait, what legion's this? Uh, surely he meant Fortensis. It's like, well, you know, his Latin was pretty good. I mean, yes, okay, we have manuscript issues, um, but, you know, maybe it was both. You know, and Fulminata is another, you know, this this whole idea of the Legio Fulminata and it's when does it get this epithet? And uh, it keeps that epithet, but it's Mark Antony who gives it the epithet uh, Fulminata in Legio 12, um, not not Marcus Aurelius, because there's the idea that it's the thundering legion because of the, uh, the miracle of the rain depicted on Marcus Aurelius's column. You're like, ah, oh, clearly here. You're like, no, 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 uh, at least 160 years before, 100, 200 years before, it's called that legion. So, you know, so there's all of that kind of amazing detail that we have from a late Roman source in the Natitia that connects to earlier Roman history. But you don't have to go to the late sources for that. I mean, you can go to anything like Virgil and, you know, already by the time that Virgil is becoming, you know, quoted in places like Pompeii, um, you've already got, you know, uh, Arma, Werumque, Cano. And, of course, immediately it's like, uh, sorry, what happened to Canto? Cano. Uh, okay, it's already being, you know, abbreviated and, you know, uh, you know, sl- a slang term for it introduced there. And I mean, that's, you know, first century and already it's, you know, it's going to be something that will, you know, continually go through the, you know, the eventual dropping of the, the double I in, in, in various bits of Latin. It's just, you know, partly down to slobbery and part partly down to just evolution, natural evolution. Well, I wonder I wonder whether it's actually education because you find Ammianus using Ensus for sword and Gladius for sword when by the time he's writing in the, you know, the 390s AD, that no one's using a Gladius. No, you know. Well, they're yeah, using okay, a sword. They're using a sword, but it's it, that's a... Ensis is a is a Virgilian. But then you poetic. have that you have an evolution there as well in terms of you've got the gladius being used as that really generic term for sword for so long. And but actually by the time you get to the later period, Spatha has actually taken on that role as, uh, instead. And in, you start to actually get you know Spatha thrown around or Spathe um in terms of you know the, referring to the troops using swords but actually then they're, they're not um you know necessarily using a spatha it's, it's highly, highly doubted um but on the other hand it's just it's slang yeah it's exactly i mean in terms and the meaning changes i mean by the end of i think by the third century uh, all warships are called liborna because they don't even know what a trireme is anymore cataphract and and clibinari are fascinating uh, and then you've got the Bucalari. We've got an article uh, in the issue about the Bucalarius. Um, that these are these are very specific terms. So the Clibinarius uh, has a fascinating etymology. We think it comes from the Sasanians, you know, the common contact with Sasanians. But then we've got Sarmatian, fully armoured horsemen on Trajan's column. You know, where their horses are covered in scale mail. They are covered in scale mail from head to foot. Uh, and so that you know, and then we do get the cataphractoi uh, or the cataphractari. Uh, coming into the to the late Roman Empire, uh, the heavy cavalry, we know that. But then there's this other distinction of the clibinari, and you're like, hang on, when is a clibinari not a cataphractari, vice versa? Uh, and then you've got the bucalari, and you're like, what? But then the etymology of them is fascinating because, again, these sources often gloss those terms, so they clearly understand that their readers are not going to know what that means, and so they say, oh, that's this. And so the fascinating thing about that is that the terms are often so. Clibanon Klib, is the one of the etymologies for for a clibinarius. There's, there's also the idea that they come from a Persian word, which is possible as well, um, a borrow word from from because they we think they're a Persian unit originally, and therefore that makes sense. But the the clibanon is the camp stove, uh, a Greek term for camp stove, not a Latin term for camp stove. So the idea is that they are basically covered in metal like an oven um so so you'll find translations of that term being baking tin men or you know oven men and i think again uh ferret temque is is i mean you know the iron iron cavalry and so that's kind of this amazing etymological tracing but it's also fascinating because you get this adoption of terms for units which evolve and 
you know, why are they called what they're called? Um, so bucalari, for instance, we think comes from bucalatum, which is the the hardtack biscuit. So biscuit men. Uh, and everyone says, oh, well, it's because they were given that ration. You're like, but hang on, surely everyone was given that ration. So that's why like saying swordsman, he's a swordsman. It's like, but everyone is a swordsman. Everyone has a sword. So it's so like they're biscuit men. They're all given this biscuit. And I was thinking, uh, and this is just putting it out there, that the scale mail of the bucalari was biscuit shaped. And therefore to call them the bucalari was not about what they ate, but the fact that their armor, like the clibinari looked like the oven men, that the bucalari looked like biscuit men because it looked like their armor was just a rose of biscuits, which of course is very ineffective against enemy weaponry. And you're much better off having having bronze or iron scales, not biscuit scales. I was going to say, for our American uh, viewers here in North America, I think what Murray is saying is cookies as opposed to biscuits, because biscuits are different than cookies. Yeah, they're so not a breakfast to, food. Not a breakfast food. You know, food. talking about dialects and how things change, you know, yeah. as across water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, now I've got this picture of, you know, monster cookies, because, of course, for those of us who are not from North America, cookies are, are circular, whereas biscuits can be almost any shape. Food and armor in the same conversation. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> And we stretched a question to a half hour, but we haven't really answered Mark's questions about the ethnicities. And and I, well, the Murray made uh, no, no Murray, Murray Murray did go there. Yeah, but I was just going to add that another another important source for the composition of units is um, the diplomas, and of course they also appear uh, disappear in the mid third century. So we just don't have as much idea, I think, of of the. The families and the, and the lives of the of the individual soldiers, as we relatively do for the earlier empire. Where, by the way, we we have lots of debate about whether units maintained their um, ethnic cohesion even in the th- in the second century. There is enough for them to keep the pride of that title. You know, they don't go. Well, we're not we're not from you know. X, Y, Z anymore. Let's not call ourselves that. We still find that the inscriptions name themselves as that unit, even if that cultural designation sort of no longer exists, Criticum and uh, Batavi and, and, and several others that, that keep themselves alive for a long time. So there's some kind of residual layover that stays in the unit to at least want to keep the, the pride of the name alive. Yeah, and again, you're talking about a society which which values tradition, so they're going to keep these long I mean, associations it's, it's, with it's things. It's exactly the same as we do, uh, as modern armies do. I mean, modern armies usually, like you know, they're, they're all, pretty much all of them have far fewer units than they did a hundred years ago, and then you see now it sometimes been, instead of the regimental, one regiment carries the tradition of uh, a past regiment. One regiment is now some kind of amalgamation of various other units, and Battalion X carries the tradition of that unit, and Battalion Y that one. And sometimes even at company level, you know, Company So and So is the tradition carrier of that regiment from three hundred years ago, because it it attaches, a, you know, the army attaches a value to the the prestige and and um, the accomplishments and the battle honors of previous. Of, of, of its ancestor units, really. Yeah, I think that it's fascinating that idea of the ancestor of the unit because you've got that, you know, you've got several legions that exist to the Natitia and beyond. Uh, you know, we've got, I think the latest mention is five Mac- Macedonica in s- the seventh century. Yeah, we had an article about that by Ross Cohen a long time ago. Right, right, right. So that idea persists for such a long, and even under the, you know, the Arthurian sources talk about legions. So, you know, and these are these are sources written in the 12th and 13th centuries writing about the legions of Roman Britain, you know, but that idea of the the legion and and coming back to my previous point about, you know, men covered in metal, the idea that the heavy cavalry and shining brightly in their armor and cataphractoi, there's one unit of cataphractoi, I think, in Britain, in the Natitia. Um, is that where the the idea of knights, you know, these these knights that we get from a later medieval tradition comes from? Um, which is again a fascinating like evolution of a, of a of a myth. Uh, not that Arthur's a myth, everybody out there before you leap on me. Um, but I just you know I'll cover I'll cover both bases. Uh, but you know there's there's so much, and it's funny because that's what's latched onto that tiny little bit of information persists. Not not 
all those other bits that could have persisted, they all disappear. Those are the ones we want to study. And then there's this one kind of thread of idea that they stays. And one of them is the legion, the idea of a legion, the idea of, of a Roman legion, even though by the fourth century in the the Byzant, you know, the, the Constantinopolitan, well, it's hard to say, uh, New Rome's legions are different to Rome's legions. And Vegetius writes, you know, we should restore what they were, but uh, that what what you know the strength of the legion is is uh, possibly down to a thousand men by the time that Ammianus is writing. Um, you know, there's there's again at the, the siege of Amida, he talks about the fact that there are seven legions present, and then says the entire population of the town under siege is twenty thousand people, and a late, much more like to nineteen oh three editor adds Centum to 120,000 men because 30 can't have seven legions and only 20,000 people. Seven legions is 35,000 men. Therefore, it's got to be 120,000 men with civilians added. Some them. of Julius Caesar's armies would easily have fit in 20,000. Dyrrhachium, uh, when he crosses into from from uh, Brindisi to Dyrrhachium, he's, he's got 25, 25,000 men, 500 cavalry only. Uh, and I think that's seven legions named, and you're like, these are way below strength. These are these are <laughs> barely legions anymore. They're like the light brigade. There's only a hundred of them left. Uh, but again, weirdly, of course, uh, that analogy is that they're still called the light brigade. There's a hundred of you left. You know, the Gloucesters wiped out almost to a man. There's still the Gloucesters. There's four of you left, but they're still you're still that unit. Uh, and that you know, uh, whereas in Rome you get that kind of. Uh, which Rome had a fabulous solution. Well, we'll just twin you. You're a Jemina now. Yeah, you're twinned. You two, we're merging you. You know, And they both, therefore, shared the tradition of both legions that became the new legion. It's traditions we carry along, uh, all of us, and, and, and in Rome too. And, of course, ah, I can bridge this. How did, how did Constantinople end up carrying the tradition of Rome? Well, I think that's one of the fascinating things. They were Roman. They saw themselves as Roman. They call themselves Roman. They only ever perceived themselves as the continuation of the Roman Empire, uh, to the point that you know uh, Justinian is is reconquering the West under Belisarius, and you know gets very close to reconquering Italy and and reestablishing the Roman Empire. So our our split of West and East, and then the East evolving into Byzantium, a term that is only used for the first time after the fall of Constantinople in the 16th, uh, 15th century. So I think it's a 16th century term. Uh, and now it's become the term to refer to the Eastern Roman Empire, never used during the existence of the Eastern Roman Empire. Um, even though a Byzant is a coin that's issued by the Constantinopolitan Roman Empire, which is just confusing. But uh, that idea, they, they saw continuity. Uh, so many of these things we're pointing out as interesting continuums weren't for them interesting at all, just natural. You know, well, of course, we're Roman. Um, and they refer to themselves as Roman. And even our sources will talk about the Romans, meaning the troops from Constantinople. And long after, um, long after the Western Roman Empire had fallen, we find them being referred to as the Romani. So their, their idea was that they were the Roman Empire. To the point where they still refer to a res publica as well as a form of government, which is intriguing. And, well, and, you know, one of the many names for the city of Constantinople was just the city, as Rome had been the city, and it was it was built as New Rome. So it was not built as Constantinople. Inclusive of a myth, uh, a legend, you know, the foundation myth of there being seven hills uh, like the original. Absolutely. And, you know, that Constantine wasn't so egotistical to go, I'm going to build a city after myself. He was no Alexander. Um, so he basically built New Rome, and it doesn't get called Constantinople until I think his grandson, or is it his, uh, I'm not sure when the first time it gets called Constantinople is, but it's long after his death. How do we assess the the transition of the Roman army from the early to the later empire because i i have a strong idea of what the early empire legion looked like roughly 5000 or so legionaries scutum short sword uh, armor what have you whereas the later uh, pilum whereas the later roman army the typical infantryman would have had an oval shield uh, a short stabbing spear uh, a longer sword of spatha uh, 
you know, armor probably, uh, although they're often depicted simply in long sleeve shirts, tunics, what have you. What, where, what, what do you think is the the uh, the impetus or the the driving forces behind the Roman uh, the evolution of the Roman army over all that period because obviously it looked very different and did it fight differently uh, uh, it, it it must have because the, the the reason I look at it is is that if I could just uh, preface my uh, give the background of my course that is the early imperial legions were the great conquering legions of of, of the uh, republican and imperial period and the empire the later empire had different units the 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 ones the uh, roman legions or, or units in the west failed but those in the east succeeded so we see that it was it the it wasn't the weapons really that you could say maybe made the difference or the or organization and tactics well so well, the first thing to say probably that some of those those changes that you talk about are introduced in the second century so mark i think it, it, it's a dictum in management theory that structure follows strategy and i'm sure that there's a parallel in military theory as well um and, and, and you could think that so around about the time you get to hadrian going into sort of marcus Rus, really that the, the expansionist idea of conquering and acquiring new territories has reverted to no. We'll we'll hold nominal frontiers, whether they're ocean, mountains, rivers, whichever you want to call them. Um, and and there seems to be attempts at trying to accommodate for migrations of peoples and various other. So so effectively, you've got what you alluded to, I think, there, which is yes, there are tactical things that change, and and just like modern armies and troops have done, you know, for centuries, you adapt your doctrine and your arms and equipment and so on. Um, and and I I think I think that's basically it. And it, what's fascinating about the magazine, this issue, is all the magnificent depictions of walls, for example, around Constantinople and other fortresses that just sort of literally cling to the hillsides. I mean, Augustus would have not understood this, and neither would any of his contemporaries. But that's what they had to have in order to be able to withstand the enemy of the, of the time. So it, I think what you're seeing is once again this upends the idea that. That there's a, there's a did you use the word mon, monocultural mono what's it the, the, the point is that, that, that it's a, it's a constant evolution right it, it's not a monolith it's not a stasis it's it's an evolution and, and part of I think that the the skill that the Romans have probably more than other ones is is their ability to adapt and ultimately when the yes when the West falls because the adaptation has actually actually changed the entity completely. In the East, they seem to be able to combine the solid elements of Roman administration with a, a Greek sort of Hellenistic approach to living combined with Christian religion. So you have a sort of more of a, an organized structure that keeps the whole thing, but is only ever able to cling really to the end, the, the eastern end for, for those reasons. Yeah, interesting. When the West when the West falls, they abandon We Are Rome very quickly, uh, whereas the East may, sticks to We Are Rome, even when the Rome of the East is unrecognizable as the Rome of the West, or even our picture of the Rome of the West. But I think I think Jasper's got a hit on the head because one of our great advantages and disadvantages is the third century, whether you call it a crisis or not. The, the, the evolutionary changes in the third century and our lack of knowledge and information in the third century means we have this big gap. But we've got suggestions such as the column of Marcus Aurelius where every single legionary has an oval shield. There's no... Uh, oh, sorry. There are there are uh, rectangular curved scooter only in the depiction of a testudo on Marcus Aurelius's column, which is you know one seventy to one eighty AD. Previously, you've got the uh, column of Trajan, which has got everyone with a rectangular curved scutum, but the only surviving rectangular curved scutum is from Dura Europus, dating to two fifty six. So clearly, and then we've got a couple of Masonium. Uh, and other other silver plates from the fourth century, which have no one's carrying them, but then on the ground there is a curved rectangular scooter, and you're like, hang on a minute, you haven't been used for two hundred years. What are you doing there? Um, which is kind of we have so little material to survive. Going actually, there is some continuity. We just don't get it suggested, you know, uh, and again, or, or, or somebody's just copying some just older thrown picture. A Exactly. Um, and then one of the things you get, of course, is the chain mail is constant. This idea that the, and there's been some evolution with that. Um, there's an upcoming issue, uh, a couple of issues time about the, the the Roman legionary in the first century AD, that the 
lorica segmentata, again, not a Roman term, um, a modern term to describe banded armour that we see on Trajan's column and even on Marcus Aurelius' column. That's this evolution of armour. It's like, well, no, it seems to be a stopgap because it appears in the first century AD and then it disappears by the end of the second century AD. So it's only really got a 150-year lifespan, but male chain mail is around that whole time. Scale mail is around the whole time and into the period beyond. So you find that, you know, Roman legionaries are wearing chain mail throughout their history. They're wearing scale mail throughout their history. Even helmet typology is problematic because you've got helmets, which are, you know, people love to put their helmets in a very, very tight pigeonhole that, you know, like fashion today, yeah, you wouldn't be wearing an italic G next year. It's like, it's a helmet. I can dig one out of the ground now and it's still useful. I can, you know, still wear it and it will still protect my head. That idea that you, the, the, a lot of those are very thin, Amari, that it's not very much protection anymore. I don't think protect. I mean, you know, some of those plastic helmets that you have to work on, uh, you know, wear on building sites, they don't protect your head very well either. But, a, a you know, they're still better. Montefortino, maybe. Yeah. yeah, but they're still better than nothing. But I think the funny thing, of course, is that in that we have the Spangen helm coming in again, it's depicted on Trajan's column. Uh, and the Spangen helm becomes the common helmet right through until the the seventh, eighth, ninth century. So there's this sort of those elements that are there, but they don't fit with our idea about the Roman legionary. And yet they are present to show you actually there's more continuity than change. Um, and we, I think, the problem we like to see because of our idea that there is Constantinople and there is Rome, we look for con- for change, not continuity. But I think there's more continuity then there is change. Uh, and I think, you know, there's the manpower crisis. There's all these things. And and again, we get the problem with the sources. Agathius, writing in the 6th century, is the first uh, historian, I think, to give us a number. He says, in times past, there were 675,000 men in the army. That might not be the exact number he gives us. And now there's much, much less. And that's blamed on Justinian reducing the number of men in, in Roman legions. But there's evidence that those numbers have been dropping for quite some time, mostly in reverse. We find laws about you are not allowed to, you know, cut your thumbs off. You're not allowed to stop your sons from entering the army. So there's all these laws about... Augustus who are, here. Well, well, no, I'm, I'm thinking fourth century. But again, there's continuity. Yeah, but the, the thumb cutting thing. Right, Murray? Uh, right, Lindsay? Well, if it's true, yeah, it, it, it may be apocryphal. <laughs> but there's, but again, people people having their sons avoiding uh, enlistment is not a change; it's continuity. Uh, so there's, you know, and again, coming back to the Ammianus, you know, how can seven legions only be twenty thousand men? Well, it can be for Mark, for Julius Caesar. Why can't it be for the siege of Amida? Um, you know, and these these units, and I think that's one of the things, of course, about this. Why are the Roman armies of the fourth century? not as effective. Like, well, there's five times less men. Uh, you know, you haven't got legions of five. You've got legions of one. Um, and therefore, a 1,000 men can't do what 5,000 men could do. The, their enemies may also have been more robust. That That is, the Sassanid Persians proved to be, I think, a much more dangerous opponent than the Parthians had. Yeah, I think also that what happens uh, is the prevalency of mounted enemies. And and the corresponding mounting of, of Roman armies under Belisarius and others, and even I think uh, the battle of uh, you know against the Huns and and Catalanian plains is is a is a mounted battle, not an infantry battle. Um, I think it's cavalry against cavalry. Yes, controversy. Um, you can read about it in my controversial book. No, um, but but it's all cavalry because that's what the Huns are known for. That's what they continually do, even though they're not heavy cavalry. They are light. Cavalry, but the Vandals are entirely mounted. Um, you know, Belisarius's amazing campaigns in North, in North Africa are using hugely outnumbered cavalry forces against the Vandals. Uh, and we're given, you know, he has fifteen thousand men, ten thousand infantry, and five thousand cavalry. And poor old, poor old Belisarius's infantry—they're always marching to the battle, and he's already won it with his five thousand cavalry before, by the time they get there. Um, and the funny thing about that is he's supposedly fighting a Vandal army of eighty thousand men. And you're like, hang five against eighty—that's crazy. But he wins, um, and possibly because they are light armored cavalry. 
you know, wearing less armor and his are uh, heavy armored cavalry wearing more armor, Bukalari and, and Cataphractui. So, um, you know, fascinating stuff. End the conversation. That's yeah. Shut it down. You, you kind of, <laughs> everybody is gobsmacked, Murray. I think we'll have to say, you just have to read about it in Nature Warfare issue 16.3. And in the meantime, thank you very much. I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.